Thanks for that. Um, I don't have any uh, uh, conflicts or uh, to discuss. So what is ulnar neuritis? The most commonly injured nerve at the elbow. Uh, compression can occur at multiple levels. The arcadis struthers, the, uh, ligament of, the Osborne uh, ligament, medial border of the triceps. And in addition to compression, symptoms can be caused by uh, friction and or traction. Um, if you've never seen me give a talk before, I'm a diehard, born in New York Yankees fan, so I tend to put pictures of the Yankees in here, especially when I'm in Chris's presence. So, um, you know, compression can be caused by physiologic hypertrophy of the medial head of the triceps or the flexor or carpi ulnaris. Can be caused by thickening of the arcuate ligament in the cubital tunnel. Can be caused by intrinsic lesions, cysts, osteophytes. You, Chris, Chris showed you the one where the guy got hit with the ball. That's a that's a difficult injury to replicate. But you do see some cysts, some intraneural cysts, and lipomas around the nerve that can cause compression, take up space. Medial instability leads to increased stress. We saw the one that he showed, and we've talked about how the ulnar nerve can be unstable. It can undergo increased tensile stress as the medial joint space widens. So, you know, we think about how much widening should the medial joint space have, you know, up to two millimeters, three millimeters, something like that. If it gets up to even five, six, how much is the next medial structure taking up? And that would be the nerve. So the combination of wrist extension, elbow flexion, and shoulder abduction, i.e. the early phases of throwing, increase intraneural pressure sixfold compared to the relaxed nerve. So you do see an increase in intraneural pressure every time a person puts their arm in this position. Friction neuritis, commonly due to subluxation or dislocation, as we've seen, um, can often be due to congenital hyperlaxity. But as Chris showed, you got to know where the nerve is. Sometimes these things are not where you think they're going to be. There's even some anomalous nerves where there's branches and things that you're just not expecting. So what is ulnar neuritis? It's typically the insidious onset of pain along the medial elbow, often exacerbated by overhead activities, intermittent paresthesias in the ring and little fingers, but the symptoms may radiate down the forearm and not just be in the hand. Um, you can get medial elbow tingling and aching pain. You can get clumsiness or heaviness of the hand and fingers, particularly during throwing, and you may even have that snapping or popping if the nerve is unstable. Tenderness along the medial elbow, along the course of the nerve, especially within the cubital tunnel, is kind of pathognomonic. We do an elbow flexion test, either flex the elbow up for a prolonged period of time or push on it. As I said, if you really want to create symptoms, you push on it long enough, somebody's going to have symptoms. And it's critical to discern medial instability in the presence of this because you wouldn't just want to assess the nerve and deal with that in the presence of an unstable elbow. So you have to assess the whole thing. As we showed, we manually palpate the nerve for stability. We do the Tunnell sign, as I showed you. Diagnostic tests, all of us get sent MRIs. And, and I, I love MRIs. It's the best test we have. But MRIs are a mixed bag. And I often tell people MRIs are like cameras. There's the high-quality digital professional version with quality musculoskeletal radiology readings. And then there's the underwater disposable camera versions from the strip mall MRIs that we get where you might as well be looking through a kaleidoscope and you can't believe that the radiologist actually said what they said because you actually can't see anything. So start with plain x-rays. They're generally negative, but you might find some things that you're not expecting. Stress x-rays, they're uncomfortable and it does require a specific piece of equipment, but it's not a bad way to rule out instability. MRIs are great. EMGs may be positive, but the majority are non-diagnostic. And I really think that this is a place with the nerve where our ultrasound colleagues and I will caveat this, I have no idea how to turn that thing on nor how to use it, but I'm getting better at seeing what they're seeing. Dynamic ultrasound can really visualize the nerve very well. It's very close to the skin and you can see it, you can characterize it, you can track it, you can track it in multiple planes. You can get a feeling whether it's flattened, whether it's moving, what's around it, how much inflammation. So I think diagnostic ultrasound has really taken a place in looking at the ulnar nerve, um, not just in throwers. And here's a couple of pictures of an ultrasound of an ulnar nerve, and you can see the medial epicondyle, and you can see where the nerve is subluxing anterior as they flex the elbow up. You can actually track the nerve. And being able to see the morphology of that nerve, you can see it's flattened on the right middle slide as it moved anteriorly to where it normally would be. So that nerve is taking some pressure, but it's also pretty mobile. So treatment, we want to start with non-surgical stuff. We rest from throwing. We do all the things that we all know how to do, we rest for brief periods, longer if it's uh, more significant. 
NSAIDs, topicals, modalities, every, I tell the PTs and athletic trainers, throw the kitchen sink at these things in terms of decreasing inflammation. Nerves are tissues that don't tolerate a ton. The ulnar nerve actually probably is the most tolerant nerve in the body. There's a saying in our world, if you see the radial nerve, it's not going to work. The ulnar nerve, you can see it, you can handle it, you can pick it up, you can brush it, you can pull on it, and it's going to come back. So a lot of times the ulnar nerve can tolerate these things. So we can do some modalities, we can treat these things. And when the symptoms decrease or resolve, we gradually get them back. And there's a pretty high rate of return if we get to these things early. And that gets into how much the players or the athletes are willing to kind of come to you and say, hey, I'm having this problem early versus it's been going on for five months and now you're under the bus. Surgical management has definitely evolved uh, over nearly 100 years. And there are a bunch of different procedures that have been described, all with decent success at dealing with all the nerve problems. But I think in this world, we have to really think about it in terms of the thrower. In situ decompression is a simple operation with a low risk of damaging the blood supply. It's low risk of scarring. You're not doing a big operation. It's good in the general population, but it's not great in throwers because you haven't really eliminated the friction. And those people may get some bleeding around that nerve that's going to cause some problems later. And you've left the nerve right by the ligament. So if there is a little bit of laxity, whether they have an ulnar collateral ligament injury or not, you really haven't solved that problem. So I think it's not a great operation in throwers. Um, and I, I can come back and talk about that with the UCL repair because for a while I was doing in situ decompression of the nerve and I found that I was generating a fair amount of scarring around the nerve because I was leaving it there. Medial epicondylectomy. I don't think probably anybody in the room has ever done this, so I'm going to gloss over this. Although it probably has some role in the history books, it's really not uh, something that we would do these days. Subcutaneous transposition. This is a procedure with very little scar formation. You're really taking the nerve and you're putting it in the subcutaneous tissue. So you're kind of creating a fat, um, almost envelope or sleeping bag for the nerve in the subcutaneous tissues. Um, there is a lot of potential for hypermobility here. It goes with the skin. It's not really um, down on the, on the flexor pernator mass. It's problematic for thinner athletes. Obviously, it depends on how thick your sub-Q fat layer is. Again, not really recommended for throwing athletes. The sub-Q fat as the housing may not be the best, uh, best way to keep the nerve where you want it. Intramuscular transposition, uh, a lot of scarring around the nerve can tether it, can also create compression from the muscle function, traction neuritis. Again, not recommended for throwing athletes, but interestingly, this is what Dr. Job did in Tommy John's original operation, and he had a post-operative nerve palsy that required a second operation. He eventually got back. He actually had a claw hand for a while, and he got back, and we all know that he won more games after than he did before. Submuscular transposition, again, not for overhead athletes. There is a lot more interest in, by our hand colleagues. The hand society people are really moving in the direction of submuscular, intramuscular transposition. It creates a little more of a direct root, less kinking, and it's protected by the muscle. I don't know how good I feel about this. I, I've had a couple of hand surgeons, pretty prominent hand surgeons, say they like this for throwers. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not at that point yet. <clears throat> and then subfascial transposition is really the one that most of us do, whether we're using a sling of the ulnar of the uh, intermuscular septum or a leash of the fascia from the flexor pronator mass. Um, either one of those works. It does create a direct root. There's no real trauma to the muscle. And this is our preferred technique when we're doing these for, um, for throwing athletes with or without uh, UCL surgery. So relative immobilization, I don't like to immobilize the elbow for very long. A sling or a splint at 70 to 90 degrees for a few days. Start some wrist and hand exercises. We want those muscles moving. Then we start some passive and active assisted stuff, strengthening later on, and then throwing usually by 8 to 12 weeks. And usually these people are back at 3 to 4 months competing depending on what level they're competing at. Ulnar neuritis in kids, it's most common in 11 to 14 year old pitchers. Treatment is usually rest with a gradual return. We rarely transpose people in this age group. Uh, usually you can get these people to settle down. That's a long time ago, that picture. Um, post UCL ulnar nerve issues, is the numbness and tingling following an ulnar nerve transposition a complication? If it resolves spontaneously in hours, days, or weeks, is that a complication? If not, we may need to reconsider our literature. If it's prolonged for greater than six weeks of symptoms, that's less common. And that certainly relates to perineural swelling and scarring. And that truly could be a complication and likely is. 
But if somebody has some ulnar nerve symptoms for a day or a couple hours, I'm not sure that qualifies as, as a complication. So when the symptoms persist, is the cubital tunnel, is the nerve in the cubital tunnel where it was? Is the pain there? Is it anterior where the nerve is? So we got to ask ourselves, people that come back with post-op symptoms after a uh, ulnar nerve transposition, where is the pain? Is it where the nerve was? Is it where the nerve is? Is it posterior? Did we close the cubital tunnel too tightly? Did we leash up that tissue too much to close down the tunnel and prevent the nerve from getting back there? Is it anterior where there's perineural swelling and scarring? And again, dynamic ultrasound may be our best test. So our guys have been doing ultrasound guided hydro dissections around the nerve when we've seen this. Um, and a very low risk procedure with, uh, with really good outcomes. They've been able to do uh, successful hydro dissections. One or two of these separated by two weeks can often create uh, a better function and more mobility of that nerve and decrease a lot of those post-op uh, neural symptoms. Open neurolysis is the last resort and we do sometimes have to do these things. And in my opinion, I think that speaks to our need to be meticulously obsessive about hemostasis anytime we're doing any procedures around nerves. I, I think that makes a huge difference. A recent conversation I had with a major league athletic trainer who said, uh, Doc, why have people gone away from transposing the nerve? We have two guys having ulnar nerve transposition after reconstruction who didn't have a ulnar nerve transposition at the time of the surgery. To me, I think it's one of those things that goes either way. I think it's a six and one half dozen other thing. If you don't transpose the nerve, you may get symptoms around the nerve and then you gotta go transpose it. And if you do transpose the nerve, you may get symptoms around the nerve and you may have to treat that. But, and honestly, in 23 years, I've never seen a UCL reconstructed patient or repaired patient ultimately not get back because the nerve was the primary problem. That doesn't mean they don't have issues with it. It doesn't mean you may not have to have a second procedure on it. But I've never seen somebody ultimately not get back because of the nerve. So I think the nerve gets a bad rap both ways, whether you move it or you don't move it. And, and so I think that we just have to be prepared to deal with those things each way. So in summary, it's a relatively common problem. Generally, managing non-surgically with rest is the way to go. The unstable nerve, the recalcitrant traces, uh, cases can be treated with transposition. And uh, usually they're back in three to four months. The vast majority of reconstructed ulnar nerve issues are treatable non-surgically, and, and I think we really need to consider, consider what constitutes a complication in that regard. Our ultrasound colleagues are possibly our best new heroes in this area. Biologics, nerve wraps, things like that, I think as always we have a lot to learn and maybe there's some role for those things in the future. So thank you. This was uh, the uh, World Games was in Birmingham this past summer and uh, the Ukrainian team was well-liked, and this was the Ukrainian female who won the sumo competition. This was actually the championship match. Um, I probably don't have to tell you who won. It literally, it, it was less than three seconds, and she pushed that lady out of the ring. So thank you.